Hello, my dear patients. So, you know, in large scale, one of civil infrastructure, decision making under uncertainty is part of the job. That's just how it is. But civil engineers don't get the luxury of building 10 to the power of 6 versions of the bridge, offshore wind turbine, or aeronautical structure to consider a relative frequency interpretation. And as you'll hear, challenges don't stop there. You also have to consider natural hazards, such as earthquakes, rockfall, and typhoons. Yeah, in case you were wondering, civil engineering is not among the boring jobs. To talk about these original topics, I had the pleasure to host Michael Faber. Michael is a professor at the Department of Built Environment at Alborg University, Denmark, the president of the Joint Committee on Structural Safety, and is a tremendously deep thinker on the Bayesian interpretation of probability as it pertains to the risk-informed management of big infrastructure. His research interests are directed on governance and management of risks, resilience and sustainability in the built environment, and doing all that with Bayesian probabilistic modeling and applied Bayesian decision analysis. Before we start, though, I'd like to thank Colin Caprani for recommending Michael as a guest. Colin, thanks a lot for your longtime support on Patreon and for making our LBS community so lively. But good news, there are also new patrons whom I would like to warmly thank, especially those in the full posterior tier or higher. This time, I'm talking about the unique Naoya Kenai and Stephen Rowland. Thanks a lot, folks. I hope you know how much I appreciate your support wherever you are in the world. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 59, recorded January 26, 2022. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash learnbayesstats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good busy and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Wes Abazian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. Abazian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. michael have all favor welcome to learning bayesian statistics thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here yeah thanks really thank you for taking the time and i want to also warmly thank one of my longest patreon supporters colin caprani for putting us in contact i love when that happens and so thanks again to all my amazing Patreon supporters, and in particular to you, Colin. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> and so as usual, let's start with your background, Michael. So what is your origin story? I am originally a, a structural engineer, but already uh, during my master project, I went into reliability, structural reliability, modeling and analysis. And uh, that was already an entry into Bayesian statistics, Bayesian modeling. Then I did my PhD on the excursions of uh, uh, non-homogeneous Gaussian random fields, which uh, just uh, ignited uh, much more interest into probabilistics. And um, uh, from that point on, during my PhD, I got in contact with a super strong research group at the Technical University of Munich. I visited there for a few months, and then I went there in a postdoc position afterwards and worked with uh, Professor Rüdiger Racklitz in Munich. And that was really my entry into uh, probabilistic modeling and, and, and Bayesian thinking and Bayesian perspectives. And I spent uh, maybe uh, two and a half years uh, together with uh, Rüdiger Rakwitz. But we stayed in contact and uh, we, uh, we started a small uh, company together where we did consulting for the aerospace industry. 
the Ariane 10 rocket system was being developed at that point in time, and they were anticipating to put the Hermes space vessel with astronauts on that. I had the opportunity to work for MAN technology in, in Munich on these things. So I spent a couple of years working for the aeronautical industry. And uh, at that point in time, I also took up some contacts at uh, El Fakitin in France, in Po. I got mm-hmm. involved in some development projects for them on integrity management for their offshore platforms. That was, um, let's say, maybe my first real massive application of uh, Bayesian updating, b- because that's basically what we are, we are doing when we are developing strategies for integrity management. Then uh, after a couple of years, maybe three years as a private consultant working in a super small company for interesting uh, industries, I got an offer from uh, a consulting company in Denmark called Kovi, and they are specialized in super uh, widespan uh, bridges. They anticipated that they would get the consulting job building the Øresund bridge And they wanted to hire me to take care of uh, issues relating to safety and reliability of uh, of the bridge. Uh, It just turned out that uh, I I took the job, but they didn't get the project uh, on the consulting side, uh, but they got it on the contractor side. Anyway, I I spent um, eight years with uh, Kobe working on on, uh, interesting uh, projects and applying in real projects, probabilistic modeling, Bayesian probabilistic modeling in the upgrading and uh, reassessing larger infrastructure projects. Then I thought it was time to learn something new. Uh, There is a certification society, De Norske Veritas, where they do uh, and have been doing really high quality work in application of structural reliability methods, including, of course, uh, Bayesian modeling. And uh, uh, I took a job uh, there. So I went to Oslo in Norway and worked for them. And then uh, just by coincidence, I got a suggestion to apply for a professorship at ETH uh, in Zurich, which I applied for. I didn't really think that that would be possible, but uh, I actually got the job. So I, I, uh, I went to Zurich and worked at ETH for, for almost 11 years. I got a professorship there. After, well, during, during this period of time, I also had the opportunity, and that was really great, to go on a sabbatical in China at uh, Tsinghua University. After the um, 11 years in Zurich, I, I was contacted by uh, the uh, Danish uh, Technical University And they wanted me to take over a position uh, as uh, head of department of civil engineering. And uh, I I took the job and then I I held the job for six years. Then I went on sabbatical again in Australia uh, in the research group of Mark Stewart in University of Newcastle. After that, I was offered a professor position uh, at Alboa University. And this is where I am now. And uh, here in the last uh, five years, I've been developing up a new research group. And I think I have, uh, well, we have a good team and we are all working on uh, aspects of uh, probabilistic modeling, uh, focusing on on risk of systems, resilience uh, of systems and sustainability of systems. Thank you for that uh, yeah, very thorough introduction. And I'm actually curious how you came to that field? Like, did you start already like studying after your, like your undergrad and your graduate studies? Like, was it already in civil engineering and about, like you say, risk of system, risk of engineering and so on? Or did that come later? And if, if that came later, how did it came up? Did it come up? The risk uh, interest came up or? When and why were you interested in engineering basically was it very early on or is it something that you kind of bumped into uh, whereas you you studied something else i don't know i'm, I'm curious about like the, the origin of the path yeah well uh, i think there's a lot of co- coincidences uh, out hmm. there uh, at an early stage uh, when you grow up yeah. and um, i think i was inspired by my my father uh, to uh, become an engineer he was an engineer himself maybe a more practically oriented engineer, but at least mm-hmm. that, that sparked uh, this direction. And then uh, during my uh, university studies, I realized that, um, but it was pretty late in, in, uh, in my studies, I realized that 
Yeah, I had uh, maybe an interest to uh, understand things uh, at uh, a little more detailed uh, than uh, just finalizing exams and uh, going out and becoming an engineer. It was actually my uh, idea to go to the United States to uh, take my PhD. But when I asked my master thesis supervisor if he would help me to get some contacts in the United States, he said, ah, but you're not going anywhere. You have to be a PhD here. I got stuck in the system. <laughs> But then I had the opportunity to go to Munich on my postdoc, and that was my big, big fortune. So Professor Rakwitz uh, really became my mentor, and uh, he was a very close friend all the way up to 2011, uh, where he passed away. Actually, do you remember when you first got introduced to Bayesian stats, and also why? They were attractive to you? It was already at that point in time. And uh, it was uh, the philosophy of my mentor, really, that oh, okay. representing knowledge in a manner that, uh, that facilitates that we can uh, improve knowledge uh, consistently as we collect information consistently with the, uh, with the information that's uh, available. And then we, we were involved in, uh, in, in several semi-industrial activities where we dug into more finer details of modeling. At that time, triggered by developments uh, going back to basically to the 50s already on uh, from the aeronautical industry in the United States on the, uh, applying uh, Bayesian updating as a means for integrity management of uh, aeronautical uh, structures. They, they were using these techniques to uh, mm -hmm. establish inspection plans for, uh, I believe, fighter jets. And we were then uh, working on schemes which uh, were also being developed in the offshore and uh, oil and gas production industry where fatigue cracking in the structures uh, due to repeated wave loading is, 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 is a big issue. But that's actually a super application <laughs> in, a, in a relative uh, simple manner of patient updating. So we kind of specialized in, in this area and uh, developed it further. But of course, uh, Bayesian modeling From the side of the work of uh, Professor Rakwitz, I think one could say that that took basis in uh, early developments of modeling of the performances of materials. Mm, there, there had been a lot of work in this domain at that yeah. time. Mm, okay. Yeah. So it was actually quite, like, quite early on oh, yeah. in your career that you started. I mean, that makes sense also, like, based on your field. I mean, it's definitely a field where repeated experiments are, are not really a thing. Oh, you can you cannot rebuild a bridge for one million times. No, this is the issue. Uh, the, yeah. Basically, every every well, many structures they look alike, but yeah. and, and even if they even if if the blueprints are identical, then the context uh, is always different. Yeah, it can be the chemical environment or the loading. So it can be really many things um, which uh, differ, and uh, mm. the concept of frequentistic information and. and in such situation is um, it's just uh, it's not really useful <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly the approach that uh, has been applied really in our field is that uh, that these the semi deterministic type of mechanical modeling principles which are applied in uh, in structural engineering and uh, are formulated in in a, in, a, in a probabilistic manner where the um, uncertainties associated with the models is being uh, uh, introduced and uh, and all the variables entering into the mechanics are also being prob modeled probabilistically in, in a Bayesian way, which uh, then facilitates that we, to the extent that we can, then we can uh, we can perform some uh, experiments on uh, on the characteristics these parameters are representing, and uh, and we can combine it with whatever prior information is available of relevance for the situations which are addressed. And then we combine it and, uh, and we are able to also, and, and this is a big, big thing when we are ensuring the integrity of the build environment. And, and that is that at a later stage where uh, structures, they grow old and uh, to some degree are subject to deterioration, we are able to do some uh, testing on the structures to see uh, how is it going with these or uh, those uh, properties. And then we can we can update, and then we can see the effect on the modeled reliability or probabilistic performance characteristics of the structure, which are yeah. relevant for safety. Yeah, so, yeah, we'll we'll definitely dive more into that in a, in a few minutes. And actually, like you answered a, a question I had, which was like, how do Bayesian steps help 
here. You basically just told it in a stand. And yeah, but that clearly makes sense, like given your field that uh, you would be naturally drawn and pretty early on to patient stats because like it's really a great fit for your field. But so before diving in, into that a bit more, can you define your field actually for listeners and what makes it unique compared to usual statistical problems, let's say? Well, comparing to a, a classical uh, s- a statistical modeling and use of uh, statistical modeling, I think you already touched upon it in the sense that, that there are hardly no repeated uh, situations that we are addressing when we are trying to model the risks related to, for yeah. instance, the build environment and observations of, uh, of semi-identical uh, situations are super sparse. <laughs> so we really have to apply a Bayesian approach in order to be able to manage the lack of knowledge that we actually have, which is essential for managing the safety and also the economic-related uh, uh, performances of, uh, of the built environment. And here, let's say, over the last decade or so, where the focus is on uh, robustness and resilience and sustainability, we need to take these tools, this uh, perspective into those contexts and take benefit of it. Uh, of course, uh, statistical uh, techniques are uh, p- applied uh, here and there. We also need that in, uh, in, in a Bayesian framework. We are really uh, combining the subjective knowledge with, uh, with the classical uh, interpretation and uh, also the frequentistic interpretation of uncertainty. So this is one of the nice things with, with Bayes. And of course, the more data we have which are relevant for the particular situation, we filter out uh, slowly the subjectivity and we approach something uh, which is less and less influenced by priors. Hmm, I see. And okay. And actually, in, in general, actually, how Bayesian would you say the field is? Are you quite in the minority here in what you do? Or like is most of the field using the, the same techniques as you are? This is an interesting thing. I used to say that uh, even the, um, the engineers, which have no background and no knowledge of uh, the application of uh, probabilistic modeling and analysis, the normal Structural engineers, uh, you could probably say that about uh, the normal, any uh, type of engineers is that, that they are Bayesian. All of them are Bayesian. They just have, they have extremely strong priors. <laughs> and um, the community of people working with a probabilistic mindset and uh, applies probability theory for the purpose of, uh, of designing and uh, also maintaining structures. Uh, that's a relatively small community, unfortunately. Mm. Several reasons for that. It's not that yeah. we don't offer education. We uh, we mm-hmm. we push a lot. We also get really good students. Uh, I, uh, so maybe we are moving forward. But I'm not sure we are moving forward enough because the volume of students is also uh, steadily increasing. <laughs> There is an unfortunate uh, development that the level of knowledge of um, candidates going out of university may not say that it's decreasing, uh, but it's definitely not uh, increasing. So there seems to be more focus on producing many engineers rather than, uh, uh, let's say, good uh, quality engineers. So our opportunity really to get them interested in something which is actually not really needed when they get into the industrial applications is a little difficult to ignite. Okay, yeah, I'm actually curious about that. I wanted to ask you that question later in the show, but uh, here that feels actually very natural, so let's do that now. Because So you're talking about the different reasons then. So basically here, like the field should probably use mostly Bayesian methods because they're great fit for what you're doing. But you're saying that many people don't use them. And there are several reasons to that. One of them being, of course, education. Like That's almost always the case. But another reason might be that it's difficult then to pick up patient stance afterwards, after you're done with studying, especially if you're like not that interested in two stats and just want a tool that works. Hmm. So on that tooling part, actually, this is something we can already have an action right now, especially with the open source community and development mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. like we can make that happen faster than yeah. educating more people, which will take 20 years. So I'm curious from you point of view, what do you think are the biggest hurdles in the Bayesian workflow currently for your field in particular, and where making progress on that and making things easier for people to use and understand 
would help patients that pick up in pick up in fields where they are mostly needed. Yeah, so I'm not sure I have the uh, sharpest uh, answer to your question. I have a feeling that tools are not really useful unless you know what they can be used for and what not used for. I think a little bit the uh, the uh, problem we are facing by getting probabilistic mindset into the engineering field and uh, in, into the sciences for that matter as well, that is that we, we have an educational system which maybe does not have the optimal perspective to the discussion on what can be known at all and how can we represent what can be known in a consistent manner. And so uh, young students, uh, it, it goes all the way up from uh, grammar school, high school to uh, university and throughout university. Most students, they are never confronted with the idea of accounting in the way we observe the world with the aspect of, uh, of uncertainty. And, uh, and we, the classical way of uh, introducing models to students is to say that this is a model <laughs> And this is the model. And then they learned how to apply it. In some extreme cases, they even, uh, they even learn uh, to uh, develop a model based on experimental uh, evidence and, and then to model uh, also or represent the uncertainties associated with the model, but only rudimentary. And, and they never really get into a probabilistic thinking. And to get into a true, uh, let's say, probabilistic mindset, it's also the experience from myself. It did not come, uh, it's not something you can take in a course in a few months and, and then you uh, really appreciate the uh, implications of, uh, let's say, this view of the world from a probabilistic perspective. So I think we, ha we have to start earlier in the educational system to open up this perspective. Things are maybe not as deterministic as we, we think they are, right? Yeah, oh, yeah that's that, that for sure. I mean, you're preaching to the choir right here. If you have understood that, then mm -hmm. you're also in a better position to identify what tools could uh, at all be needed okay. uh, yeah. or relevant and in, in a given situation. And actually, what, what tools do you use yourself? Like when, when you do patient stance uh, and patient management models, like Mo I'm curious, most what, of them what are you we, using? Most of them, yeah. We are using a lot of uh, Bayesian probabilistic nets. Uh, both for bottom-up uh, modeling, uh, but uh, definitely also for top-down uh, modeling here in the last uh, five or six years. The uh, classical, uh, let's say, probabilistic uh, BPN type of modeling approach in engineering has been a, a unidirectional, I would say, from the bottom up, uh, starting with our mechanistic understanding of uh, the bits and pieces and, uh, and then how to combine them uh, consistently. But, but now, is, uh, not least, with all the power of uh, machine learning technologies, the benefits we, we get from uh, combining this type of uh, top-down modeling with the engineering understanding, uh, which we can represent by at least skeletons of structures which we already have made available through bottom-up modeling, this combination is just uh, extremely powerful. So we are, using, we are using such approaches in many, many applications. And uh, so that goes from the modeling of uh, the wave and, and the wind load uh, environment, uh, in, in, for instance, in the North Sea, to the uh, progress of uh, degradation uh, of corrosion in, 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 in large bridges, uh, to variation in, in soil properties uh, in different layers uh, with respect to different uh, phenomena. And, it's everywhere. It's um, and, these applications. But, and, and what are you using to do that? Like, are you using Stan or PMC or like? Yeah, any? in in some cases, uh, of of course, we are, we are using Stan. But um, in many cases, uh, being in Denmark and having good connections uh, around the uh, the origin of the developers of Fugin, we apply that, of course, also a lot. But then also Genie and Smile is uh, is being applied quite frequently, and and then uh, in general. We are, of course, also just uh, using uh, whatever we can find in our routines and we put the bits and pieces together in order, in order to get optimal algorithms. Let's dive a bit more now into what you really do, because I'm, I'm really curious about how the structural engineering um, community manages risk. So 
Can you take an example of your work that you particularly like and that you think will, will help listeners understand what is Bayesian modeling used for structural engineering and also maybe inspire some some students who are listening to us and are wondering about that. The little less exciting uh, part uh, where we are using, but uh, but in a way, uh, maybe one of the most important uh, applications that um, is um, related to the design of uh, new structures. When we establish the basis for design of new structures, we establish this basis based on probabilistic models. And these models are formulated in a, in a Bayesian manner so that they provide, let's say, a generic base providing uh, all the priors which are associated with the uh, materials models and, uh, and the load models and the model uncertainties. And then, uh, of course, that facilitates that when such models are applied in, in a context where more knowledge is available and the experiments can be harvested, then these models uh, can be updated. Just as a starting point, all the probabilistic models for all relevant building uh, construction materials and all relevant loads like wind loads, wave loads, snow loads, uh, soil pressure loads, and uh, what we can imagine, performances of glass and, and steel, aluminium, all this has been, um, we have established models for this. And uh, here I would like to also mention the Joint Committee on Structural Safety which has been uh, pioneering significant uh, parts of this work uh, globally. And it was an, uh, a pre-normative group of experts which was uh, put down uh, or set uh, established in uh, 50 years ago, in 1971. And uh, since then, this uh, joint committee has uh, developed and uh, is refining and further developing what we call the uh, Joint Committee on Structural Safety Probabilistic Model Code which is this generic thing which can uh, be used in, uh, in specific contexts. Now, with this uh, Bayesian probabilistic modeling framework, what we are doing is that we are using this knowledge we have about the performances of things which can be built out of these materials. And we, uh, we then combine these probabilistic uh, characteristics uh, using uh, mechanics. Then we get probabilistic mechanics and based on probabilistic mechanics, we can model the reliability and, and uh, therefore also the safety of structures. Now, in practice, buildings are not being designed using probabilistic methods. They are being designed according to, so based on uh, equations and criteria which are described in what we call design codes. And uh, these design codes, in order to ensure that the structures which are built they have some criteria which incorporates a certain level of safety. And this safety format, which is uh, built into the design codes, define the so-called design parameters. So the design co codes, they are filled with equations which uh, are based on mechanics. But the input parameters to these equations, they are design values and they account for the uncertainty associated with the material characteristics and loads and and model uncertainties in the mechanics. But using this probabilistic model code of the Joint Committee on Structural Safety, we are able to identify which are the design values which should be put into the codes for these properties in order to reach a so-called target reliability or safety level. So we can decide, and we also have rationales on how to decide what is the appropriate safety level uh, in a given context for a given, given type of a structure. We can identify that, and then we can uh, use our methods to calibrate these design values, which are then put into the code. And that facilitates that engineers who do not really have time, too much time to uh, put into the design process and make difficult choices on probabilistic models, they are just using these, we call them semi-probabilistic design rules, which look deterministic, but they actually are based on probabilistic modeling. In this way, we are providing the basis for all these codes. This is one important and maybe the, the most important uh, application, even though it, it may not sound super interesting. 
Of course, there are also very spectacular cases when very unique structures are being built, like uh, super long span bridges or very large uh, tunnel uh, systems. When we go beyond the domain where the design codes are actually developed. Uh, so design codes are developed to cover the most normal types of structures. But when we go outside the envelope of design codes, then the safety which is built in to the design code does not really apply because we are out of context for the identification, the calibration of the uh, design codes, the safety calibration. And in those cases, we need to dig into the specifics of the individual projects. And, and this is hugely uh, interesting. Both in, when we are designing new structures, we have to understand what is actually going on in the location and with the uh, design concepts which are, are being envisaged. And that uh, requires uh, full uh, probabilistic models, at least on the major issues. That can be related to uh, earthquake uh, excitations, uh, which is a frequent thing that needs to be addressed, but also the stochasticity uh, around the um, the dynamics uh, of long span bridges under wind uh, load is a very challenging uh, issue to to model consistently. And there are, there are many interesting aspects related to very special types of projects. But then there is a huge need for probabilistic modeling when it comes to keeping structures efficiently alive, when especially when they approach what is normally understood to be the end of their lifetime. This typically structures are designed for lifetimes of uh, 50, 100, uh, 150 years. And when we approach the end of the lifetime, then uh, it's just like when you buy a uh, a cheap watch, then you can count on that it will fail <laughs> when the guarantee ends. It's not exactly the same with structures, but, but they do degrade. And when they start degrading, then the probabilistic method, they are the only means we have to prove that they are still safe enough and that it can still operate fully, safely, as uh, required originally when, when they were designed maybe for 10, 20, 30, uh, 40, 50 years more. And uh, you are sitting now in, in Argentina, in, in Buenos Aires, and one really good example is the Sarade Brazo Lago Bridge, uh, which is very close to you, crossing the Panama uh, rivers. At, at some point in time, I believe it was in 1994, the director of uh, COVI, where I was employed, he was actually visiting the Ministry for Transportation in Buenos Aires, and he was uh, trying to sell the services of Kobe for uh, general mm -hmm. uh, support in Buenos Aires at the ministry. And then during the meeting, suddenly the telephone rang, and uh, it was the um, people out on the bridge of Sarada Brasolago. They called the ministry to tell the ministry that a cable state had ruptured. And of course, our director, Klaus Ostenfeld, he took the opportunity and he offered the services of Kobe. And uh, three days later, I was standing in Buenos Aires, traveling out to the bridge. And it turned out that uh, this cable stay bridge, which had many stay cables, I cannot remember now, uh, but uh, probably something like uh, 60 or 80 cables. Now, hmm. each cable is, uh, yeah. is constructed uh, by um, a couple of hundred individual wires. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, the, we, we went out there and we could see the ruptured cable, and we, of course, all the wires were ruptured in, in, in that one. Then we opened holes into some of the other cables and we saw that up to 60% of the cable, of the wires in the individual cables, they were uh, cracked and ruptured. And now the big question was what to do with the bridge, right? That's like very dangerous, right? Like cars, good cars and trucks go on that bridge again or like, or what was the bridge like integrity really? so much damage that the bridge was completely closed. Yeah, the big question was, uh, would it fall down? As we were standing there, should we shut it down? Should we block the traffic immediately? What could actually be done? So we uh, very carefully assessed the situation and, uh, and, and made uh, inspections. But the thing is that you can, you can make inspections of the cables and wires, but you don't get perfect information. So mm. there's, uh, there's significant uncertainty associated with the inspections. 
And uh, in order to uh, really uh, appreciate the condition of the bridge, I had uh, in, in the office in Buenos Aires, I had to develop probabilistic models for the uh, capacity of the strings with the information we had at all points in time regarding the degradation of the cables. And based on these probabilistic models, uh, we were able to, uh, to devise a strategy for maintaining a certain level of traffic on the bridge and for rehabilitating the uh, bridge without actually ever uh, totally stopping the traffic. And, and this was uh, tremendously important because this bridge is a link on the Mercosur. So it's like a lifeline, a lifeline uh, from uh, Argentina to the, uh, to everything uh, north of Argentina. And of course, uh, the updating of our estimates of the safety of the bridge took uh, enormous benefit from the inspections, which we could utilize to, by means of Bayesian updating to, uh, yeah, to check what is the actual safety. Applications like these are, uh, of course, super interesting. Uh, several yeah. cases uh, where we have observations, for instance, of uh, super long cracks in uh, offshore structures. This is also uh, a very exciting type of uh, application, uh, which is very special, where you really need to uh, find a way to uh, not only apply probabilistic thinking, but combine it uh, with the contextual uh, relevant mechanics. And this is very, very challenging. And it's not something you do alone. And that's also why it's so interesting. You really have to solicit all the relevant knowledge from uh, other subject matter uh, expertise which is available or which can be collected in order to make something which is relevant. Yeah, it's definitely uh, fascinating and super interesting because, I mean, also, you can clearly see the the impact here of your work and of your model, right? Because if you, if you don't intervene here, there is clearly people at risk of death. That's definitely always, I guess, something that's very interesting and makes the, the work even more fascinating. We also, apply, so we, we're only talking about structures, but a huge application area in civil engineering that is also uh, related to the modeling mm -hmm. and management of risks uh, due to natural hazards. This is a super important uh, domain where probabilistic modeling is, uh, is really not only required, but it's also challenged because there are always needs for improving mm. uh, not only the modeling, but also the techniques which are required or which are able really to do the probabilistic analysis of the models. This is also conceptually super uh, challenging. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like concretely, uh, for instance, in, in that use case, you have to talk to different stakeholders. And these are not, I'm guessing, always stats people. So in that case, like, what did you do? Who are those different stakeholders that you have to talk to in a project? And how do you communicate the results of your model to them? This is a super uh, relevant uh, question. In some cases, it's rather a challenge. But I would also like to uh, maybe start out with um, highlighting that uh, in some industries, you can find really highly informed clients. I have really good experiences in the domain of, uh, for instance, offshore operators or wind turbine system uh, operators who have, who have a, a strong understanding of the domain and are able to appreciate, let's say, the standard uh, professional subject, uh, semi-subject matter expert communication. Th those are really out there for sure. And, and the same uh, in the nuclear industry. You don't need to worry too much. They are used to the, most of the concepts. I would also like to say that in, uh, in, uh, in, in many, many other contexts, it can be a problem to communicate what a risk is <laughs> even mm. and how different components of uncertainty affect the uh, ranking of decision alternatives. This is maybe uh, more challenging. I find uh, maybe the uh, easiest approach, and this is also because we focus on, on the application of probabilistic modeling and analysis on the context of supporting decision-making and ranking of decision alternatives, this is something people relatively easy can understand. Mm, yeah. What sometimes is a problem is that uh, semi-disputes can emerge among mm -hmm. so-called experts on, for instance, the significance of epistemic uncertainties on, uh, mm. on decisions. 
And uh, when several experts are around the table together with the client and such issues come up, <laughs> then the client gets really nervous. <laughs> be, be, because this is not easily uh, so, understood, yeah. and uh, and and this is actually something which which comes up maybe not very frequently, but it it does come up. It is an issue. What did you find was were efficient ways to communicate about the risks and probabilities and uncertainties, and what were inefficient ways to talk about those topics? If you are talking to an informed client, then you better do it uh, rigorously and uh, in a, in a scientific uh, manner. Okay. Uh, but, uh, so then if, you can, uh, like, you can bring up the concepts of probability, of uncertainty, of prior yes. knowledge, of uh, highest density interval stuff like that, and and maybe also optimization of decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are, we meet uh, many at that level. But uh, if people do not have uh, this background, then um, it's not a good idea to go into too much detail on the modeling concepts and uh, normally what I focus on yeah. are assumptions and preconditions which are in the um, under the control of the client mm. and then uh, we try to establish a level of trust where the client uh, accepts that uh, the client does not maybe need to understand the mathematics and also not necessarily the mechanics uh, or whatever else is involved but is presented the outcomes of uh, different preferences. So if, if yeah. I want to do this, then this is uh, what uh, the right decisions will be or the optimal decisions. And these decisions may be limited by these and these and these factors, right? They would like to understand their space of governance, of having influence on whatever uh, solution they're seeking or seeking advice on. Mm. So that's a more constructive issue. And I also experienced that focusing on the issues where more knowledge. So if I present to my clients that, okay, so this is what we know now, we can account for that. And based on this knowledge, I can, I can tell you that, uh, so this is what appears to be the right order of choosing different options from you and you can choose depending on uh, boundary conditions uh, that I may not know uh, but the, uh, the client will know and then but given that we would have more information on this aspect then we would be able to provide you a stronger decision basis and talking about the sensitivities of the modeling in order to solicit the possibility maybe to make some experiments. So assessing in the, in the, in the sense of a value of information analysis, where does it really make sense to get more knowledge? Do we need more analysis? Uh, do we need the experimentation? Do we need uh, some experiments? What is it that will bring us value at the present based on, mm. we know, on what we know? And, yeah. and this is something we um, push a lot and that works. So you, you don't, it's not the detail of the probabilistic modeling or problems with yeah. tools or something like that, that the, the clients, they, they, they don't need to know that. Mm. This will not bring them value. They want to know what are their possibilities to uh, contribute to the identification of a good solution. Uh, this is super interesting and, and resonates also with my own experience, yeah. both in open source or the electoral forecasting models that I do, or even more in the consultancy that we built at PMC Labs, where I find, and, and in teaching also, of course, where I find that the real power of patient stats are these forward samples. So I'm drawing samples from the whole model before it sees any data and then drawing samples from the whole model after having seen the data and updated the parameters. And so seeing like really the power of Bayes formula in action and also like it's super concrete for the clients and for the any stakeholder because these are new data. So this is really mm -hmm. what you observe in the world. These are like really the outcome viable that you put in the model. Yeah. And so that makes it so much more concrete for the non-stats people and even for the stats people, but especially for the non-stats people, makes it so much more concrete to think about the priors, think about the assumptions, the model, and what your generative story of the phenomenon you're studying is, basically. And so, yeah, that, that power of forward sampling is incredible and also is paired very well with counterfactual thinking, which we are really well wired to do mm. with our brain. 
And that you can do that, as you were saying, like test several hypotheses in the model and then come back to the client and tell them, okay, so under that hy hypothesis, that would be what the model would say and what the predictions would be under that hypothesis, that would be that, under that other hypothesis, that would be that, et cetera. And that's just like so much more intuitive and, 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 and easy for for the, the stakeholders. Yeah, and the strength of the pre-posterior kind of uh, decision analysis mm. is a means to investigate mm. where it, uh, I mean, based on the best available knowledge we have about uh, any system, right, we can, we can generate the performances and then we can see how we can take benefit of these outcomes in uh, strengthening our strategies on the management of the system. And, this is something where we can do much better. <laughs> the uh, pre-posterior decision analysis, I, uh, I, I think, is not uh, well appreciated hmm. as it is. In the, we have been pushing it a lot because traditionally uh, structures and, uh, let's say, engineered systems, they are designed from a philosophy that if there are safety issues, if something can deteriorate, if uh, like um, systems which are vulnerable to fire events or things like that, they are built from the beginning stronger or more robust or more insensitive to these um, phenomena. So you, you build, maybe you choose to um, take a cross section of steel which is thicker because then you know over the 50 years, corrosion can take place or fatigue crack growth, uh, maybe in some locations, can take place. And you don't need to worry because uh, you have implicitly taken in, it into account uh, when you designed uh, the structure. So you, you build something which is more heavy. It has an amount of passive safety. You don't need to worry during the lifetime. This idea, this concept is uh, for the future where we are talking about the, the need to reduce uh, consumption of materials and energy consumption in producing materials, we, we need to, uh, to cut uh, much closer to the bone. So we, can, we cannot have passive uh, safety, which is imposing uh, CO2 emissions on the global community. And there we can take benefit of devising our structures with monitoring systems so mm. that we have an active measure of governing the uh, safety performances over the lifetime. And uh, this is a, uh, this is super <laughs> much more efficient. But in order really to take benefit from these uh, strategies of collecting information on how structural performances are developing over time, this can only be done in, in a pre-posterior type of uh, a Bayesian modeling approach, uh, decision analysis. And, and we have been pushing that and we are seeing that it is now emerging in, in some of the, uh, let's say, the faster moving in, in industries. The wind turbine industries, uh, they, it's basically one structural generation ago that they started. So the initial wind turbines, they are maybe uh, the big offshore wind turbine parks in my part of the world. They are now approaching the end of the design service life. But now this uh, industry is, of course, realizing, oh, but these wind turbines, they're standing out there. Maybe we don't need to take them down and build some new uh, right now. Maybe we can collect some information regarding their performances and we can use this information to reassess their safety and reliability. So this is something which is going to happen big, big scale in the years to come. And also already from the design of new structures, instead of building in passive safety, using a lot of materials already from the design concept to build in monitoring systems as a means for ensuring adequate safety performance during their lifetime. This is going to come. But whether it will find more specific uh, formulations in the standards and the codes, I doubt it. I think that there will be a, an opening for engineers with a solid probabilistic understanding. Mm. So there is going to be a need, a growing need. Okay, yeah. Super interesting. I guess it will resonate also with with the experience of a lot of a lot of listeners because these all the topics we just talked about here are not restricted to structural engineering. No. I mean I don't work in that field, but I, I completely understand what you mean and, and, and have the, the same experience in for some of, of our clients and also the teaching aspect is um, is also very related to that. So we were getting short on time, uh, but yeah, I had at sorry. least at least one other question before we go to the, the next two ones. And I'm interested in what you see for the future of patient stats in structural engineering. More specifically, what would you like to see 
and what you do you like to not see yeah they like to uh, they like to see they like to see uh, would be that uh, that engineers maybe especially engineers uh, but but the, fundamentally i think uh, any any person taking an academic uh, education would actually be introduced uh, to bayesian thinking and it uh, does not only go for engineers i mean it's also in the health sector Uh, we have medical doctors who have absolutely no idea about the concept of uh, or effect of type 1 and type 2 errors in, in testing. The Corona times, they have illustrated that one more time. The concept of uncertainty, speaking of medical uh, yeah, doctors and, uh, and medical uh, personnel in diagnosing, there are some who have an interest in probabilistics, but the diagnostics uh, is also a highly uh, probabilistic, uh, of highly re uh, probabilistic relevance. I think that we would do us all a favor if we would get the basics of a probabilistic understanding of what can be observed, what can be represented by models, and uh, what are the implications of different model choices in a given decision context. We need to get that understanding into the system, into the education as a must. In the old days, engineering studies and, and basically any other study was, of course, mathematics. We need the algebra. Uh, and then everybody were also confronted with uh, statistics and probability, right? And I remember uh, with horror uh, back on my own, uh, the teaching I received uh, when I had this basic class in statistics and probability, It was just a horror. I mean, it was uh, useless, meaningless. Uh, from it, it was presented in a way that nobody really appreciated. So we learned it eventually, and we passed the exam, and it left basically no trace in our minds. But so instead of having these uh, type of courses, a more relevant introduction in intubation reasoning, let's say the associated uh, probability theory, will which, let's say, from the Bayesian reasoning perspective, really makes sense. Probabilistic modeling, uh, hard, uh, so it was only at the time where I was, um, I was presented for this Bayesian reasoning perspective that it really became meaningful for me. And uh, I think this would be a major advantage. So what I would not like to see And then there's no doubt about that uh, Bayesian reasoning is, is going to uh, shape the world, maybe in ways we cannot uh, imagine right now, but uh, a lot of things are going on already. A lot of knowledge is being accumulated in the uh, what we also sometimes term the, uh, the high-tech providers, the tech companies uh, managing big amounts of data or developing computer power. I, I would not like to see that uh, this is where this uh, knowledge goes and then uh, it, uh, it, it works in isolation from rest of society. <laughs> that, that would be a scary science fiction uh, scenario, the way I see it. I think we would all benefit from distributing uh, this knowledge much more broadly as a part of uh, academic uh, educations so that, that professionals really can relate to it and take benefit from it. That's what I would uh, like to see. Yeah, that does sound exciting. Okay, so that was great. Uh, thanks a lot, Michael, and we'll call it a show here. But before letting you go, of course, I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. So if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Well, I have this uh, far-fetched uh, idea. <laughs> That's good. And, uh, That's the goal and, of the question. May, maybe uh, that should uh, not really uh, go into this podcast, but uh, during the last 10 years, it has become, so it has grown on me that moving away from the mechanistic perspective to what we are doing as engineers, of, of course, we are relating to the systems that we are dealing with, but there's nothing, there's nothing of what we are, we are doing which cannot be represented in pure terms uh, of information. And this is really the common denominator for any modeling, no matter what uh, domain you are in, uh, whether it's in physics, astronomy, whether it's in uh, biology, you name it, uh, structural engineering, all that can be observed can be rep represented in, in terms of uh, information. So converting this uh, or introducing this perspective is, is something I think I have taken uh, personally benefit uh, from. Just seeing as uh, whatever we are trying to govern or to manage or to model is from this perspective that also 
makes it easier to see the connections between all systems which we are part of. So in a way, these systems which we are part of, they also contain what could be understood as regularities, like physical laws which are governing uh, the behavior of uh, information, if you like, this can, uh, what can be observed. And there are many of such regularities at different scales, going down into the uh, level of uh, elements and particles, all the way up to uh, stars and galaxies and um, uh, interesting thing, things which can uh, be observed in space. Now, what would be really interesting would be to see if we can find the regularities which are governing the regularities simply by looking at this information. And to that end, uh, of course, uh, uh, Bayesian modeling schemes, uh, probabilistic modeling, Bayesian techniques would provide an interesting first shot, the way I see it, and, and probably also a very good shot. But it would be, it would be so. I would like to be able to answer the question, where does the information come from <laughs> and uh, how does it evolve, right? Mm. Yeah. And then second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? It's quite easy. I will break the rules hmm. and uh, I will invite three and uh, that would be my mentor, Rudiger Rakwitz. I am not sure I can allow that. I will I will have <laughs> if if I am invited then I will probably allow it otherwise I don't think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if I would have been allowed it would have been uh, my uh, my mentor uh, Rakwitz and uh, and Kent and Base uh, at the same table at the same time. But it, uh, since this is not possible then I would definitely go for uh, Einstein. I think that would mm. be a super enriching uh, conversation. Yeah. Well, that's definitely a good table and I will ask for the invitation to be sent to my address in France. Thank you very <laughs> much, Michael. Awesome. Michael, thanks a lot for coming on the show. It was awesome to, to talk about all those topics with you. And it was the first time we were talking about uh, about that on the, on the podcast. I had no idea that software engineering was using patient stats in so many ways and in so important uh, ways in that it has such a concrete impact on our lives. And of course, the pen with concrete is intended. So yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks again to Colin Caprani for making me aware of all that um, that part of the world that was using Bayesian stats. It's exactly what the podcast is for. So please, listeners, if you have recommendations like that, get in touch with me on Twitter or by email, and I'd be happy to, to take it from there. It's always going to, to make people more aware of the amazing things that patients are doing in the world. As usual, I put resources and a link to your website, Michael, in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Michael, for taking the time and being on this show. S thank you. It was a super uh, nice conversation. And uh, I, I think it, it was a great opportunity to uh, spread the word uh, out a little bit broader, which we are not uh, always uh, very good at. So I thank you for this uh, opportunity. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's what uh, I and the podcast are here for. So happy to play my role. Okay. Take care, Michael, and see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.